This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. His career story was turned into a major motion picture starring Matt Damon, the real informant, Mark Whitaker, on this edition of Conversations. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for joining us. We welcome to our program Mark Whitaker. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here today. In case people don't know you, you were the whistleblower in the big ADM case years ago, and just recently there was a major motion picture made about your life story, so to speak, starring Matt Damon. It was called The Informant. And so uh, you're here in Pensacola and with us, before we get into what actually happened with the ADM case, tell me a little bit how you got started, because you climbed the corporate ladder quite nicely. So lead me up to your career at ADM. Okay, I, I was born in a very small town in Ohio, and actually my wife was born right down the road. We've been together since she was in seventh grade and I was in eighth grade. Okay. So we've been together. She likes you then. <laughs> yeah, we've been together a while, married over 30 years. And we both went to Ohio State, Ohio State University, and I did a bachelor's and master's at Ohio State. And I, then I went for a PhD in biochemistry mm -hmm. at Cornell University, and I graduated age 25. It's pretty young for a PhD in biochemistry. Right, right. And from there, I entered the corporate world and, and mostly in Fortune 500 companies with Rostrum Prina and Degusa Chemical Company. So most of them were companies 10, 20, 30 billion in revenues and mm -hmm. tens of thousands of employees and worked my way up the corporate ladder quite quickly. And I was made my, to the point where I was vice president of Degusa Chemical and ADM hired me away in 1989 to be their president of their biotech division. About 20 years ago, 1989. I was 32 years old then. Okay, okay. Give give the folks an idea of sort of what ADM does, what kind of company it is. ADM is a huge company. They're about 70 billion in revenue and 25, 30,000 employees, and they were they would be in the top 50 on the mm -hmm. Fortune 500. So they're a huge company, but they're more of a wholesaler, not a retailer. When you go to the grocery store and you buy something off the shelf, be it a soup or or bread or about any kind of food, and you look at the ingredient level, even beverages like mm -hmm. Coke and Pepsi, mm -hmm. and you look at the ingredient level label on the side, it would be difficult to find something that doesn't have something from ADM in there. Okay. They're one of the largest food ingredient companies in the world. Okay, and so how long were you working for them before you realized, eh, these guys aren't on the level here? I started seeing that my first few months. I joined there in 1989. I was 32 years old, as I mentioned. I was divisional president. And I started hearing about some of the price fixing activities and stuff going on within my first even four or five months. But it didn't yet reach my division until a couple of years after that. Kind of describe what was happening with price fixing, what that is and how, how that works. Well, price fixing is, is a serious crime. And, and it's, what, it's where you get together with your competitors and you form a cartel. In our case, it was an international cartel because ADM was the only American company in that business. And then there, then there was four foreign competitors. And we at ADM got together with those foreign competitors to form this price fixing scheme. And that was just on our product, but there was multiple products in other divisions too. And when you get together with your competitors and you actually split up the customers and you say, well, you take customer X and we take customer Y, and then another competitor takes customer Z. And when you split the, that market up like that and you jack your prices way, way up. I mean, we were starting off with this product at about 60 cents a pound and it eventually made it to well over double that. And wow. it ended up making hundreds of millions of dollars a year if you take all the product. Actually, would make hundreds of millions of dollars extra per month. Really? So it would have been well over a billion dollars a year made extra profit from this price fixing scheme when you look at multiple products involved. How far down the corporate chain did it go as far as people knowing what was actually going on? Not very far. It was actually pretty much at the top. Uh, the vice chairman of the company, which would have been number two, he was one of the ones that I was taping with the tape machines that I was wearing for almost three years. And myself was divisional president. And there was another divisional president too. So there were three guys that went to prison for price fixing. It was pretty much towards the top of the company. Okay, so this is going on and you at some point realized, hey, maybe I need to say something about it. How did that come about? Uh, unfortunately, and I wish I could say it was me and, and I wish I had the right moral compass back then where it was me, but it really wasn't. It was really my wife who was a stay-at-home stay mom, mother, raising three young children. And I told her about the price fixing and I, and I was feeling a little guilty about it, but I was making a lot of money for a young guy, mm -hmm. a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And if you had the stock options to it, it would have been well under the seven, seven figure. Right salary with the base salary and the stock options. And that's a lot of, a lot of money for a 32 sure. year old, seven years sure. out of college. And sure. I got caught up in that corporate greed and, 
And I looked at our chairman at the time, he was in his 70s, and I was 32, and I thought, well, if, he's, if they're allowing that to happen, and the vice chairman was 10 years older than me, the chairman was 35, 40 years older than me, and I felt if they were allowing it to happen, then it must not be that bad, because right. these guys are top of their field right, in the right. business world. So I rationalized and justified it and thought it wasn't that bad, but the day I told my wife, the very day she made a decision, she was telling the FBI if I didn't, because she saw it ripping off every consumer in the right. world that goes through the grocery line. So I really give credit, even though I'm the one that wore the, wore the wire, even though the one I'm the one that actually discussed the details with the FBI, if it wasn't for a small town, Midwestern wife raising three young children, that case, the biggest price fixing case in history, would have never happened. So she's the one that said, you better do the right thing. Yes, yeah, okay. she really put her foot down. And so at that point, you just pick up the phone and call the FBI? No, actually, the FBI were actually in the company actually helping us with something totally unrelated. Not against ADM, but helping us with a sabotage problem. We were having a problem with one of our, our big plants. It's about a $300 million investment. It was actually a plant in my division, the bioproducts division, which is the biotech division, basically. And we were having problems with that plant. And, I, and they were going to close that plant down and, and force us to go back to the lab to work out the kinks. We were getting all kinds of contamination right. in this fermentation process. And I told management, I said, I think it's sabotage. I think someone sabotaged us, and I just, we need time to, to work it out. And I was trying to buy time to get it worked out. I wanted to bring some consultants in that knew right. what they were doing. But when I mentioned that I thought it was sabotage problem, then I thought I had, and I said I had evidence that it was sabotage, they contacted the FBI, someone in the company, to come and help us resolve that problem. And then when the FBI were meeting with me, being the president of that division, I was coached what to say and what not to say by our management before those meetings. And I stuck with what I was coached. So within three or four days, the FBI would have been gone. It would have never been a problem for the company. But they wanted to meet again a second time the same day that I met them the first time at our home. Mm -hmm. And that's when I told my wife, she said, well, what are you nervous? If they're asked, trying to help you, what are you so nervous about? And that's when I told her about the price fixing. And she never even heard of the words price fixing. I had to explain right. to her what it was right. and how it's ripping off the consumers and how we're ripping off our customers and how it's adding hundreds of millions of dollars a month of extra profit. And that's, and that's when she put her foot down. When the FBI was coming to our house, she said, if I did not tell them why they were there, she would tell them. And so the FBI came to our house about an hour after I told my wife. And I still stuck with what the company coached me. And it's the point when they were about ready to leave, that's when she put her foot down that either I tell them or, or she was going to. Then they stayed another four hours where I told them all about the illegal activity. So, so, so it's really, my credit goes to my wife. So, so, so the FBI agent is there and you said, well, one more thing before you go. And, and what was their response when you started telling them? He was a little bit, little bit shocked because here it's one of the biggest companies in the world. Right. And, and I mean, he was a little bit shocked, but he stayed about four hours, actually about midnight that night and took a notepad full of notes about all the things going on. And uh, my wife and I kind of felt at that point, it, for us, it'd probably be over with. They'd mm -hmm. go tap some phones or do whatever they do. And I never realized within two days after that, I'd be wearing a wire for three years every day. So they contact you and say, hey, we're gonna wire you? How to, d take me through that. Well, he brought uh, the agent that I, dealt, that I worked with, very nice guy, I'm friends with all the agents, and his name was Brian Shepard. He brought a supervisor down two days later and that's when they said, in order to get evidence, we need somebody at the very top of the organization. Mm -hmm. And we need somebody that can travel to all these places. Because these meetings were happening in Hong Kong, Switzerland, Paris. This was an international cartel with international companies. And these meetings were happening every month or two. And they needed somebody at the very top of the organization that was in those meetings to make it happen. Because they can't put an undercover agent in there. They're, they're, they, they take them 10 years to work their way up in the company. They may never work their right, way up that right, high. Right. So they needed me to to do it. And they said the fact that I told them everything, they felt that I was obligated to help them. And I did feel obligated at that point because once I, once I told them what was going on, I felt obligated to finish what I said. So I started wearing a wire within two days from the time I first met them. What's going through your mind as you, the first couple of days you've got this wire on you? What, what, what are you thinking? <laughs> I tell you, it was, uh, it was pretty tough because basically I was president of the division, and one week before I met the FBI, I was promoted to corporate vice president of the whole company and corporate officer of the company, one week before I met the FBI, and was actually on track to be the next president of ADM, right, and would report right to the CEO. The son was planned to be the next chairman and CEO, and I was, it was planned for me to be the next president. So I had a, a great career track there, no doubt about it. So here, I, it was kind of the best of times where I was promoted, and then one week later, I'm wearing a wire, tearing down the very company Right. that they think I'm building 
Right. So it's so much deception because I'm that company during the day and a loyal business, a loyal employee and a loyal colleague and they think I'm building it, but I'm wearing a wire in my jacket, one in my briefcase, one in a notebook, three different recorders running every day. And I'm basically, and then I meet with the FBI two nights a week till midnight, two nights a week for those three years. So I'm basically building a company during the day and tearing down that very company during the, during night. And in my old I, it became a life at odds with itself. Mm -hmm. I, you stop. You, you start wondering who you work for. I work for ADM. Do I work for the FBI? And <laughs> yeah. It became very confusing. Were you ever afraid for your safety that somebody within the ADM organization would find out and try to physically harm you? Yeah, I was. And actually, even in a Discovery Channel documentary, documentary, the FBI felt like, and they said that in a documentary, they felt like my life would have been in danger if I was found out that I was wearing the wire during that time. They felt like an accident could have happened. So both my wife and the FBI definitely were uh, some fe feared that something could have happened. So this went on for a period basically of three years. Yes, okay. short of three years. Okay. Now, and then at that time, you got involved with increasing your salary, so to speak, mm -hmm. without their permission. T tell that story. Okay. And actually, I, I was involved with, with a smaller fraud before, a couple years before I met the FBI. Okay. So it wasn't the first fraud that I was involved, but it was a lot smaller. But as those last few months when the FBI said they thought they were going to have enough evidence to basically prosecute mm -hmm. the case, mm -hmm. and I started asking them, I said, now, what happens when I get kicked out for being the whistleblower? Are you guys going to protect me? Are you going to protect me from financially? Because I had a large yeah. home and cars. We had kids in private schools. When you make those kind of salaries, our, our expenses also went up sure. accordingly, and we, and we were living a, a very good life. And especially when you're in your 30s, you... You're a little bit more about materialism than when you're in your 50s. So I did have a big home, a 13,000 square foot home with an eight car garage and, <laughs> and horse stables and side riding. Arena. And a lot of the executives had those kind of lifestyles because right. that's the lifestyle of a lot of top executives of Fortune 500 company. And because of those expenses, I wanted to make sure I had some financial security. And I never could find out if they really had it. They kept saying, oh, we're working on it with our... Our bosses, they said they're, they were Illinois FBI agents, and they were talking to the Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. executives or, or their bosses, and they said, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're going to try to do something, but I, I didn't feel secure. I just felt like they were trying. Even to the point I felt so insecure, I started even taping the FBI. So as many tapes, or a lot of the, I was giving them tapes of ADM that, they, that I was doing for them, but I was also taping the FBI, and I had a closet full of tapes. That I, just like they were labeling tapes of all the ADM conversations, I was labeling tapes in my closet of all my FBI wow. conversations. So I taped them for quite a bit there towards the, the last year, year and a half of undercover years. And I was taping them trying to make a commitment to protect me financially right. when I got fired for being a whistleblower. Because when I got found out or exposed, I was going to be getting kicked out. Sure. And they never, I never felt secure enough. So I really took matters in my own hand. I did a fraud a couple of years earlier with some other executives too. At ADM, so I knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. I knew the company could never come to me and say, we're gonna fire you for fraud, because if they ever came to me and said, look, you took $9 million, I'd say, wait a minute, you guys are taking $100 million a month. <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> right. And you're involved with a lot bigger fraud. Right, right. They're, so they really, there's no way they could have turned me in. Well, so I did protect myself those last few months and paid myself through an under the table bogus invoices about nine million dollars. Before we get to the big one, yeah. what were you doing prior to that? Before the FBI, you and the other executives, what kind we of did a minor? Rob, it like it was a two hundred thousand dollar fraud. I mean, okay. they were they were smaller. Also paying herself under the table, bo okay. using bogus invoices. They were, and that was a couple years before I met the FBI. They were a lot smaller, but I knew how to do it, and I knew the company couldn't do anything to me because what I knew on them. I saw another guy get caught on fraud before I ever met the FBI. The auditors actually caught him. And they wanted the auditors, the independent auditors, mm -hmm. not the company auditors, right. wanted them to prosecute. And I saw how the company let him leave with his fraud, his company car, his stock options. Because he knew so much, they couldn't prosecute him. Right. So they just, he just left quietly. And right. that was before I met the FBI. Mm -hmm. So I saw that all that happening. And so when I all of a sudden knew I was going to need money for being kicked out, most likely for being a whistleblower. I knew they couldn't do anything about it. I knew they wouldn't want to do anything about it. And so I did take matters in my own hand. And by that point too, I wasn't thinking real clearly as sure. I'm working already undercover over two years. Sure. And and, uh, and I just felt like uh, I just took matters in my own hand. So altogether you ended up taking about $9 million. It was, yeah. Along it was. The way. There were a few other executives under me that got 
part of that, so that would have been nine million for, for three or four executives, but the big part of that would have been would have been for me for sure, about seven million of that. Is your wife saying she didn't know anything about that because right. I made so much money at, at ADM anyway. She didn't know what was legal and what because I was making a very very high salary, especially for a young a young person. I was making about three hundred fifty thousand. This is twenty years ago, right? Right. Nineteen eighty nine. I was making about three hundred fifty thousand salary dollars salary for salary, right. and then tens of thousands of shares of stock option that would have been in the seven figures, right? Right. Between the two, so she never really knew what was legal and what wasn't, because either way, I was making a lot of money already. So what were you doing with the illegal money, though? I mean, we just I was keeping it in uh, foreign foreign banks. We were international company. ADM has four hundred plants around the world, and had plants in China and plants all around the world. And so I was keeping that money, and I had money in Hong Kong and money in Switzerland and money in Cayman Islands, and and ADM actually had subsidiaries in Cayman Islands, mm -hmm. so they were doing business there anyway. And so it was uh, it was easy to do. You had a lot of moving parts going on in your yeah, life. Yeah, I did. I did. It was a big mistake, and it cost my family dearly. And my wife did not know that part of it. And and I really did it because I one I knew how to do it, and two I was looking for security for my family. Right. But it was the wrong way to get the the financial security. We well, have two trains basically coming down the track. You have you with your issues that you're you're doing at the same time the FBI deal on on the price fixing. So how does it all come together? How does it all come to a head? Well, once they had enough evidence, this was about three years afterwards. We, I started wearing a wire in 92. Mm -hmm. And so June 27, 1995, they had a raid on ADM. They went to the offices, raided all the top executives in order to get the computers, the, the paperwork, the things that supported what they had on tape. Right, right. So that's when they, they, they raided the company. And right after that, I mean, within hours I got a call from one of the accountants because they did learn, ADM did learn quickly that I was the informant, that I was the mole, I was the one wearing the wire. And I got a call from one of my accountant friends saying, you know, they're going to come after you for embezzlement. They're going after you for that, mm. that fraud. So then I called the FBI and asked them for lunch and I met them the next day to tell them that the company was going to go after me for fraud. I said, well, the bottom line, if you didn't do anything, it won't matter anyway. What can they, what can they do if you didn't do anything? And I didn't even have the guts to even tell them that there were about $9 million of fraud. I didn't have the guts even at that point. I told them, they asked me the number and I said, I about $500,000 because it was just hard after working sure. with them for three years. I just didn't sure. have the guts to tell them that that night. It sure. took me a while to, to, to really open up with everything. And so eventually they found out? Or did well, eventually the company came so quick. Uh, I mean, literally within the, that same day or the following day that I told them, because the, the accounting friend gave me a heads up, mm -hmm. they were calling the Justice Department. Anyway, ADM was and says, yeah, but you're informant, you're white knight, he stole $9 million from us. And so, and they went public in newspapers. So their whole goal was discredit the witness. And right, right. So, so they knew the dollar amount anyway. Right. Within hours from the time I told him 500000 So what happened to you at that point after that? Well, I was fired uh, rather, rather quickly, which I was being fired for being an informant right. anyway. Right. And, um, and then I became a target of a separate investigation. So I was the, the white knight on the price fixing case and the one that made all the tapes, but I was getting prosecuted for the, rightfully so, I became a target of a fraud investigation. What's going through your, your, your life? What's going on personally with you during this? I mean, this has got to be traumatic, to say the least. Yeah, it was. I, uh, my life was really spiraling downwards. And, and I think a good example would be three or four months before the undercover work was complete, my wife literally pulled me off a driveway at 3 in the morning during a rainstorm. And it was a thunderstorm, rainstorm. I had a gas leaf blower blowing our leaves off during a rainstorm because I wasn't sleeping those nights. Right. Because for one, I knew that I took this money, and I also knew where the company was going to come after me gung ho for wearing the wire, and and there were just so many moving parts that I was just falling apart. And she pulled me off that driveway at three in the morning. She said, "Boy, you really need you know you need psychiatric help." And a couple months after that, I actually attempted suicide. I had two suicide attempts, and I was hospitalized and and actually uh, diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder. But it was after that diagnosis and the suicide attempt was after the three years undercover work was complete. It was after the $9 million fraud was already done. So when the treatment started making me better and so on, it was, it was too late. The damage had been was done. already done. Right, right. So then you, did you just plead guilty and go, I did go, plead go guilty to, for to fraud prison? and I went to prison. Yeah, I did eight years, eight months in federal prison. Okay. Why come out and be so open about this right now? Well, I just, for one, it happened a long time ago. I was 35 years old when it happened. I'm 52 now, right. so it's easier to talk about 17 years later than when it happened. Mm -hmm. And there was a movie coming about it anyway, right. so I mean, there, the choice is hide under a rock 
or embrace it and be open about right. and hope other, other people can learn from it. Right. I mean, it is a strong business ethics right. lesson because there, it doesn't take too much to look on Wall Street and show there's a lot of problems right. on I, Wall Street. I, I, I want to make sure that we make the point here that uh, you're very open about your wrongdoings, but on the other hand, the FBI has gone above and beyond the call of duty to basically say you were a national hero. I had a quote here from uh, Dean Paisley, who I believe was the actual uh, lead investigator on it, and basically called you a national hero. And 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 several of the other agents I read said that uh, you didn't get anywhere near the recognition and, and appreciation that you deserve. So I mean, there's something. Obviously, they thought a lot of you. This was a well, huge deal. Well, the three FBI agents and one of my prosecutors are actually even trying to give me a full presidential pardon. I mean, they support me 100 percent. And w even when the movie came out, uh, for example, Dean Paisley, who mm -hmm. you mentioned, and their interviews were going to happen in Pensacola, Florida. He flew immediately the right. next day right. for radio, TV, newspaper interviews, supported me 100 percent. And they do feel, and they went even on Discovery Channel, they felt like I, I got a raw deal. They felt like I never got credit for what I did right. And that's one of the reasons why they're trying to pardon me. And, and the three agents and one of my prosecutors have been very, very supportive. So it is a messy story, but with a really good ending and a lot of support. And my wife, too. I mean, we stayed together as, as a family, which is not the norm. When you're in prison, she moved to every prison I was at. She visited every Friday, Saturday, Sunday for eight and a half years, never missed. It's dedication. And every holiday, yeah. She must be a special lady anyway. I know she was named, what, Teacher of the Year? She Tell was. Me about in 2007, that. she was Teacher of the Year at her school at Warrington Elementary. She's a very dedicated teacher, and she became a teacher one of her life's dreams after this all happened uh, to make a living mm -hmm. while I was in prison. And the very food companies that we were stealing from and the price fixing schemes supported my family financially. Uh, the Crafts, the Tyson Foods, the General Foods, and, and all the big companies that were being ripped off of the price fixing contacted the class action lawyer who was suing ADM civilly to get mm -hmm. their money back for all the theft of them. And then after they won all those settlements, they contacted my wife and shortly after I was in prison, within two or three months and basically financed my kids through college, paid my wife's house payment. The entire time I was incarcerated, those food companies supported my family. Yeah. Talking about second chances, you seem to have made the best of it. I mean, you've been very, very open about it, and now you're once again back in the business world. What are you doing now? Well, uh, talks about second chances. Uh, the divorce rate in prison is 99%, so for a family to thrive, my wife and I just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary this past year, which is not the norm when you go to, to prison. Yeah, so imagine. we not only survive, we thrive. The three children did very well. People, when you usually go to prison, the FBI usually never support the ones they put in prison. In my case, the three agents and my prosecutor support me 100%, even trying to pardon me. And in my career, I got my PhD in biochemistry, I mentioned to you, at Cornell University. They introduced me to some people. Even while I was in prison, some other executives, that had, that they had them come visit me in, in this area that I specialized in. We do a lot of cancer research, too, with uh, selenium and cancer research. And that was what my PhD was about. Mm -hmm. And I was hired, literally got out on December 21st of 06 and was hired on the 22nd, back in my same industry the following day. And about a year ago, I was promoted to COO and president wow. of the company in the very industry that I was, the biotechnology industry that, that I've been in my whole career. So very fortunate to have second chances like that because most people that go to prison, they you lose their families. The, the people who put them in prison usually don't think much of them. Right. And right. they don't have many career opportunities. And then food companies also don't come out of the woodwork and support their families right. financially. So really, we had a lot of things go right, even though I messed up yeah. early on. How'd the movie come about? Did they contact you? And do they have to uh, buy your life story? Is that how it No, works? there was so much. There's three books written mm -hmm. on the case, uh, Dateline. There's a Discovery Channel documentary that came out August 4th uh, this year. So there's so much public information out there. They for sure didn't have to, to buy the rights. But what start, initiated it was I was doing a national public radio interview, actually from prison, from mm -hmm. Edgefield, South Carolina in 2001. And the writer of the script was listening to it in his car. He even pulled over in a, in a parking lot to make sure he could capture everything on it. And he thought it was such an amazing story. He contacted Steven Soderbergh, who's the director of, of the film, and said, boy, you, we need to do a movie of this. And Steven Soderbergh liked it right away. And uh, the, the guy, Scott Burns, who, her, who heard the who heard the National Public Radio interview, wrote the script, and they, got, they brought Matt Damon on right away. So they started planning this since about 2001. Wow. How, how true is the movie to what actually happened? Well, I think the movie is uh, very accurate in terms about the, the downfall, you know, the, the, how I was spiraling out of control. And I think it was very accurate of what untreated, undiagnosed bipolar disorder is like. Um, 
I would say the FBI have been doing lots of interviews too. They felt like maybe it missed the biggest price fixing case in history. They felt like it, it emphasized so much the human story mm -hmm. of, uh, of my fall. And also it was a comedy, so you know there was really nothing comical about the movie. But I think it was very accurate about undiagnosed bipolar disorder. But it's hard to tell a story that expands over six or eight years in, a, in an hour and a half. Right, right. So, but I think they, I think they did a good job. In the Were movie. you involved? Matt Damon did a great job. And, and Matt Damon played you. Yes, he did. And we saw the script. We had the script, I guess, for about a year, year and a half before they actually uh, uh, filmed. We've had it for a couple of years now, the, the script. And we met Matt Damon. He's a fantastic guy. And I think he's very sensitive to try to play uh, a mental illness in a, in, you know, mm -hmm. in a comical way, but he didn't want to be making fun of a mental illness, and I, I just, I he's a very much a family man and a very nice guy, and Steven Soderbergh and Scott Burns the same. Uh, we really enjoyed meeting them. We went to the premiere in New York City with them yeah. and, and had, a, had a great time there. We've got about a minute left. Uh, where do you go from here? What, what's, your, what's your goal? What do you want to accomplish in this, this second chance, so to speak? Well, I've been out of prison for almost three years. Next month, it'll be three years, and I feel like we're already accomplishing that goal. I'm having a chance to talk to a lot of young people about business ethics, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there, 32 years old, like I was, right. and, they're, and, they're, and they're aggressive, and they're ambitious, and they're hyper ambitious, and there's lots of room for mistakes, and I talk about doing the right thing, and never cut a corner, because the long-term consequences aren't worth cutting corners, so to think long-term and not short-term, and I, and I spend a lot of time with my family after the eight and a half years in prison, family's very, very important, and we don't take that for granted anymore, my wife and I, and our, and our children, and I feel really blessed, really, to to have a second chance like, like we're having. Mm -hmm. And you have a website if people want to learn a little bit more about you? Yeah, there is. It's uh, markwhitaker.com. Okay. Whitaker spelled A-C-R-E, W-H-I-T-A-C-R-E okay. instead of A-K-E-R. And it's got lots of interviews we've done, and we keep it pretty updated on, on the different things going on. Okay. And I guess, is the movie still playing in theaters? or? I think it's out. It's just started uh, premiering overseas now. Okay. okay. So it's probably a few months from coming on DVD now. Okay. Mark Whitaker, it's been a real pleasure. Fascinating story. Thank you, Jeff. Enjoyed being here. Best of luck to you. Thank and you. Best of luck to your wife, who I know is doing <laughs> yeah. kept you uh, kept you on the straight and narrow from yeah. here on out. I guess, yeah. and also doing a great job. I know being teacher of the year. So, yeah. so thanks a lot, yeah. Mark Whitaker. He is the gentleman who the movie The Informant was fashioned after, and of course, starring Matt Damon. And I read somewhere along the way that your wife said you were much better looking than him. Yeah, she says that. I don't think she means it. But. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark Whitaker. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Jeff Weeks, wishing you all the very best. Take good care of yourself, and we'll see you soon.